Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Genova Burns, Whitkoff, Greenberg Traurig. Additional support is provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, MHP Real Estate Services, New Banks, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Brooklyn and Queens, a market today is, which is becoming a key of office market. Tech office, different type production office. Lots of things are happening in Brooklyn and Queens. And as we start the 15th season of the Stoller Report, a boy from Brooklyn loves to talk about what's happening in Brooklyn. My guest today includes Seth Pinsky, who is the executive vice president of RxR Realty. Michael Rudin, vice president at Rudin Management. Andrew Kimball, who is the CEO of Industry City, and last but not least, Josh Zegan, who is the co-founder and managing member of Madison Realty Capital. You know, you have a double side. I mean, how many years were you in the administration? <clears throat> ten years. So ten years, and during that period of time, a number of this, the, the world changed in the city of New York. Did you see Brooklyn and Queens becoming what it is today with office and industrial? Well, uh, you know, I think the administration uh, under Mayor Bloomberg realized very early on that in order for us to continue to grow and prosper as a city, that we needed to produce new inventory for housing, new inventory for commercial space, in order to ensure that we could attract all sorts of different companies and all sorts of different industries. And so it was a very deliberate uh, set of initiatives that the administration undertook to try to make those areas through infrastructure investments, rezonings, um, and targeting different companies and in different industries to, to try to create exactly what you're seeing happen today. Andrew, before Industry City, you were at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Over the last eight years, it's 10 years because you were eight years at the and Navy Yard, now two years at Industry City. What has gone on? What, what's happening? What's the, the, the involvement? Because we have a, a family who's been in Manhattan for years. You know, did you have to get a permit to get past the, the line? Spe uh, special uh, dispensation. Special <laughs> dispensation, which we'll get to in a second. Right. Where, do you, where do you see this? I mean, when you started with the Navy Yard, and we were talking prior to the show, the differences in rents of what's mm -hmm. happening over there. Yeah, I think it's a, a fascinating and exciting for New York City what's happening. People want to live in urban areas again, particularly in New York City. They're picking first choice, Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, they want to make things again, whether it's a, a physical or a digital or an engineer product. I like to call that the innovation economy. And so the old definitions of office and manufacturing, I think, go out the window. And um, whether you're 
making something in front of a computer screen or you're making something using wood and machinery, um, that's what young people and entrepreneurs want to do again. And that was really the key to our success at developing that marketplace at the Navy Yard, those mixture of uses. And frankly, it'll be key at Industry City as well. How many, how many square feet do you have at Industry City? So we uh, at the Navy Yard had four and a half million square feet of space on 300 acres. At Industry City, we have six million square feet of space on 30 acres. So very dense, big, multi-story buildings that, like a lot of other industrial buildings up and down the Brooklyn waterfront, had lain fallow for 30, 40 years as large-scale manufacturing went away. And private owners and public owners really had trouble figuring out what to do with them and in many cases just filled them up with storage and no jobs. And what's exciting is... Those buildings are coming back to life with high employment uses. As I said before the show, you were originally not allowed to leave 54th Street and Lexington Avenue. Then the district changed that you could go around. Then you went to the West Village, and now you're going to the Navy Yard? Tell me what you're doing there. Well, we're looking at ways to continue to grow just our, our, our business, as Seth was saying, with the city trying to, to, to grow uh, under the, the Bloomberg administration. We're trying to grow our, our business, and, and New York City is great, but uh, as we all know, it's landlocked, um, and, and there are fewer and fewer development opportunities. So we're starting to venture out into other boroughs, looking in Brooklyn, uh, Queens, Long Island City area, and uh, we found this great project to do in the Navy Yard, uh, along with Boston Properties and WeWork, um, and it's a 675,000 square foot uh, ground-up uh, creative office uh, light manufacturing uh, building that will... Uh, you know, be one of the first ground-up uh, buildings to be developed in Brooklyn in, in, in decades um, and one of the largest outside of Manhattan. But you're going to now be competing with all these people standing over here, uh, sitting in this room. You know? Well, New York's about competition. I agree. So now you, you know, you're a developer, you're a, you're, you're a lender. So now you've done development. Let's talk about warehouses and industrial. Let's talk about Sunset Park and... Uh, Right near the Navy, Navy Yard, the Ryerson. So we have two projects. Uh, one is uh, across from the Navy Yard uh, on Flushing and Ryerson. It's a 250,000-square-foot property. Uh, it was a storage building. We're converting that to office right now. Um, the other property we're in contract on in Sunset Park, which we uh, think is a great opportunity. It's on the waterfront. It's about 400,000 square feet. And, uh, you know, the unique sort of factors of these buildings, I think they all have in common. Typically, you have great floor plates, uh, high ceilings, good windows, light and air, water views in the Sunset Park uh, case. And I think in both both instances, we're able to provide a cheaper alternative um, to a number of tenants that are being displaced from a place like, you know, Midtown Gar Garment District, downtown, other parts of Brooklyn, Dumbo, Williamsburg, Bushwick. Um, and, you know, that's, I think, uh, and as well as other tenants, they're just sort of growing within within Brooklyn. Now, Seth, you have, right now, you have the Standard Motor in Long Island City, and then you have the other building. Uh, 470 uh, Vanderbilt. 470 Vanderbilt Avenue. What's the difference in the buildings, and what what's the difference in the tenancy that you might see, if you see a difference in tenancy? Well, uh, both buildings are similar in that they're former industrial buildings that have been converted now to creative office space. Um, 470 Vanderbilt, um, there are some large institutional tenants, including the city of New York, um, but in the vacant space that we have, which is not a lot, um, we're seeing a lot of the creative office tenants that you would expect to see in a Brooklyn neighborhood coming. It's very transit accessible. It's a 600,000 square foot building right on the C train, very close to uh, the Barclay Center. Standard Motor Products um, is a 350,000 square foot building, um, also uh, transit accessible to Manhattan on the, the M line. And um, there we're seeing, in addition to the creative office users, also people who provide services to um, Manhattan, whether it's architects or engineers, people who need to be <coughs> close to their market. Now, something we were discussing part of the show is that, you know, this uh, food production uh, industry city, the service industry, you know, we, you know, it's great to have all this thing, but we need to provide the services and jobs. Where are we going to put that, those type of industries today because they're getting priced out of their markets? Well, I think it's, it's a genuine concern that we have to have in New York. Um, you know, the de Blasio administration, I think, deserves a lot of credit for its focus on, on housing and on affordable housing in particular, and its success to date um, is something that's worth celebrating. But at the same time, I think the message that's being sent in many places to the marketplace is that housing is such a priority for the administration 
that virtually anywhere will eventually be rezoned um, from commercial to residential use. And what you're seeing is that in many places, pricing for land and pricing for buildings is escalating to residential valuations. And so what happens is commercial space gets displaced by housing, industrial space gets displaced by commercial space, and at some point we're going to need to ask ourselves the question, where do we locate the vital services, where do we locate the jobs that employ the very people that we're trying to help through our affordable housing programs? What are the incentives that somebody, a company, can get by moving to Brooklyn, you know, to Industry City or to Ryerson or, or to the Brooklyn Navy Yard or to your properties, okay? There are tax incentives, there are relocation. What are these incentives for the, the general public to understand? Well, there are a handful. I mean, particularly in the, in the Navy Yard, we have a very fortunate deal where we don't have any real estate taxes, so that, that doesn't get passed on to, to our tenants, which you see in, in anywhere else in the city. You're, you're passing real estate taxes But don't you have it. certain ICAP uh, real estate Yeah, there's, there's ICAP for when you're, when you're taking an old building and bringing it back to life, and you can lock in the, uh, the real estate taxes at a lower rate. Um, but the, the big one that we're seeing now is, is REAP, um, and you know this is for, in our case, creative industries um, that are all of a sudden – discovering Sunset Park. They figure out that it's right next to the subway. Then they figure out that the rents are half of what they're paying in Manhattan. And then they figure out that all their employees live in Brooklyn anyway. And so then it becomes a no-brainer and they, they start to move out. The REAP becomes a nice cherry on top to make the economic deal right. come together. I mean, there are other forces, though, that are much bigger factors than REAP. Yeah. And I think that that's a really important point. I mean, to me, the biggest driver of economic activity in the outer boroughs is not tax incentives, although those, those clearly play a role, but it's really where talent is locating. And businesses ultimately want to be near the people that they employ, and they want to be accessible to the people that they employ. Now, now something that uh, you know, I thought of just uh, as an aside, which might pay, uh, the nonprofits in the city of New York have been priced out of their offices. Uh, they, you know, they, there hasn't been the location. Many of them were in Midtown, or they owned a corporate, uh, you know, a space where they sold the space. They're utilizing that money right now for, you know, uh, their endowments. Wouldn't it be? And I, I think 120 Broadway, Larry Silverstein's building, had the no taxes situation, which was a great way without. Wouldn't it be a possibility to create a nonprofit section, let's say, in your buildings or your buildings or your buildings? I mean, and, and because they could have in a certain way, the co-share, co -off, the, the we works or the co-working idea. What's the yeah, I, I think the, the big challenge is the one that you described, which is that if a not-for-profit owns its own building, it doesn't pay real estate taxes, whereas if it's a tenant in a building that's owned by a for-profit landlord, it does pay real estate taxes. So to figure out how to deal with that economic conundrum is something that the city would have to get involved in. But I think that's an important thing that the city can't afford to lose that business either. That, the nonprofit world is too much of the city of New York. No, they, I mean, New York's great economic strength is the diversity of its economy. Um, and all of these sectors are important because they all feed on one another. Let's talk about co. Everybody here is WeWork. They read the newspaper. You know, I have viewers from around the world. They're on an app. People, what is the co-share? Co-working has been around, as we said earlier. Uh, you know, Scott remembers it uh, from the region. You know, Regis and all the all the office shares. What do, what is WeWork's doing? WeWork is essentially taking space from landlords like us, chopping it up into smaller offices, and then providing a membership-based service. Uh, to a variety of, of, of tenants and users and different kinds of companies uh, where they can have a month-to-month -month membership, not be tied down by a conventional lease, uh, which allows them the flexibility to, to grow uh, or shrink as they need, um, to move, to be flexible. Um, and it, it's really appealed to the, the sort of the millennial generation, but also uh, people of all ages who can uh, find affordable um, office space that, that sort of fosters creativity, innovation, um, the, the kind of stuff that Andrew was talking about before, uh, where, where you're creating things. Um, and and it's, it's really, it's, it's exploded over the, really the last uh, five or so years. We, we spoke earlier, there are there at least about maybe a dozen 
co co co-working opportunities mm-hmm. in different companies. WeWorks has the most money because of the investor over there. Mm-hmm. Have Have you seen them coming to your type of properties and also, you know, because you're doing other things like in Glen Cove, you know, and Hempstead? Well, less at our property specifically, but it's certainly a trend that's affecting the entire market. And, um, you know, I think flexibility generally is something that tenants are looking for, whether it's in co-working spaces or in the terms of their direct leases with landlords. Yeah, I think if you're doing um, co-working rights, you're you know you end up leasing on the square inch instead of the square foot, so it's incredibly lucrative. I think the some of them will accept anybody who just needs a desk. They're in between jobs, whether they're an accountant or a techie or whatever, and others do curate more around creative right, industries. Right, I think and innovation. there are some in Long Island City <coughs> who are specifically geared to architecture. Or they're you know yeah, that's much right. smaller type of companies. That's right, and, and we're going to be rolling out one of these at Industry City that that will be more focused on the creative industries. And you know what you hope, especially when you're a landlord and six million square feet of space, is that some number of them then step out into 1,500 square feet that grows to 5,000 square feet that grows to 10,000 square feet. And and actually, to your point about not-for-profits, one co-working space that we do have in our buildings is at Star at Lehigh on the far west side, where a group called the Center for Social Innovation um, provides co-working space as well as other services to socially motivated for-profit and not-for-profit businesses and tries to incubate them and and grow them in New York City. So it's a trend that's not just affecting the traditional sectors, but also sectors that are trying to make society a better place. You know, New York City is known for people live, work, shop, dine, and everything over here. What are we seeing and what are you planning in your properties? Are you planning to put some retail? I know next to you in Industry City, Marvin Shine, uh, has done a number of things. He's had all five different varieties of the Bed Bath & Beyond, Christmas Tree Shop, and so on. Um, do you see retail in your type of... We are going to have some retail because you have to sort of uh, activate the property in a way, especially in some of these locations that may not have the best transportation, but you need to create a destination in some ways um, and something for the employees to do. Um, gym, uh, you know, um, shuttle buses, things like that. Yeah, in our instance, there, there's really three reasons for it. One is there's this explosion of what I like to call maker retail. So people care more about seeing what's getting made, what the supply chain is. They want to experience that. Made in New York. It. Made in made Brooklyn. New York. Made in it's, Queens. It's exploding. So whether it's food or glass blower or a shoemaker, we're going to bring them all in, put them on the base of our buildings. That's sort of one category. Then I'd say more of a mid-size retail that is focused on design and home goods. So Design Within Reach just came down to Industry City, and we hope to bring more companies like that that want to be in our culture around designers and manufacturers on the upper floors. And then the third is some larger retail that is more based purely on the economics. So we have two big success stories in New York City of massive industrial complexes that have been turned around in the last 20 years, the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Both great successes, both massively subsidized by government. So the private sector has never undertaken this, and it's because the economics are very hard to make work. We've got 18,000 windows to replace, 144 <coughs> elevators. Right here I have four private structure over here. I don't have <laughs> we, any government structures. <laughs> that's right. So there's no subsidy coming to us. We need to be able to do some higher return retail along the base of these buildings to cross-subsidize. What we now, Josh there. brought up, and, and this is part of the problem in certain, you know, the good part is a lot of people taking the subway. The bad part is the subway is very crowded. Uh, the roads are crowded. And, we, you know, infrastructure is a problem. Um, transportation for you at the Navy Yard. I mean, you, that was your home for many years. Uh, Sunset Park, different neighborhoods in Sunset Park are closer to the train. So where do we see, and you brought up before, the concept of lift, uh, car services, and other type of things. What are you seeing over there? Well, the transportation is a big issue for us, and it's something that we're going to have to solve over the next two years before the building opens. But uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we're, we're trying to trying to hopefully get a, a ferry stop coming to, to the Navy Yard uh, right at the end of the, the pier that we're going to be on. Um, as you mentioned, services like Lyft, Uber, uh, car sharing programs like Car2Go, um, or uh, Zip, or Zipcar, um, City Bike, creating more more use around City Bike in the Navy Yard, um, and then maybe offering a, sh- a shuttle service to and from the the closest uh, uh, subway stop. But you know, as you said before, 
uh, and as Seth said, you know, creating these new centers around where the, the talent lives. And we think that there is so much talent in, in Brooklyn that the Navy Yard will be uh, you know, accessible for, for people in Brooklyn, whether they're walking or, or, or biking or, or driving themselves to work. We've seen a lot of companies besides RxR. We've seen Vornado. We've seen Atlas, a Square Mile, uh, Loeb right now with Brickman, going to Astoria, going to other parts of you know Long Island City. Do you see it going further? Do you see this happening in Jamaica? Do you yeah. see this uh, translating into uh, further areas? Yeah, and and I don't think it's just within the boundaries of the five boroughs either. I think also. You know, an area that's ripe for development is in our suburban downtowns, which are in many cases surrounded by prosperity. Um, they have great infrastructure that in many cases can get you into the city faster than from different locations that are very popular today within the city. Um, and, you know, thinking about not just developing around transit hubs within the city, but also thinking about developing those transit hubs farther afield is all part of the the necessary equation for us to succeed as a region because you know the great challenge that we face as a city is affordability and the reason why affordability is a challenge is because we're trying to squeeze more and more people and businesses and uses into the same geographic area and only if we start to expand the circle but do it in a way where you still have accessibility into the center and around the circle can you really address that affordability now, problem. Part of this has been addressed like in Suffolk County and Patchogue and Hopog and uh, other neighborhoods because they were not keeping their, their young people. So they felt that they've been building in, in these neighborhoods, you know, the transit-oriented development. They're building the below grade, you know, the first level retail and then two or three levels as high as six stories over there, which is giving a community so people can live and work. Because it's great that we have all this new business coming over here, but there's not enough housing throughout the city of New York. So people have to work different neighborhoods. Yeah. Now, look, the, the suburbs for many years didn't develop because suburban communities didn't want to see density. Um, and I think what they're realizing is they're unable to retain their young people as they're losing empty nesters who don't want to live in large homes and shovel their driveways and drive everywhere is that they have to provide an alternative lifestyle. And they can do it on a relatively small geographic portion of their community and then leave the rest of the community the way it traditionally has always been. And I think that's an important part of the equation for the region. You know, unfortunately, we're, we're talking literally about two boroughs, uh, but there are five. So, so let's let, let's look at you know, and you've in your in your past life you've seen it. Why isn't all this discussion really taking place in the Bronx? Staten Island is because of the transportation, but there's a lot of things happening in Staten Island. Josh has a major involvement with Staten Island. Plus, there's the wheel and there are other ideas. W what do you see about the other boroughs, Bronx? Well, I, I think you know the big challenge that the Bronx has traditionally faced is um, one crime um, and, and safety and two, perception, um, which, you know, in some ways feeds off of one feeds off of the other. Um, I think that over the last 10, 20 years, you've seen a dramatic improvement in public safety in the Bronx. And I think as a result of that, the perception is starting to change. It's got great transportation. I, in the long run, I see no reason why the Bronx shouldn't thrive just as well as any of the other four boroughs. You know, what, what's interesting is that a number of years ago, as I said, we we're on the 15th season, probably in the 10th season, I had the Algonians. And this is, this is a time that they bought property in Long Island City 25 years ago or even longer. And I said to Tom and Fred, I said, you were here. You lived in Forest Hills. Why didn't you develop? He said, we still didn't believe. And this was before they, they built it. The massive amount, what has really created the Fauci and the other property over there, you know, in Long Island City? What do you see this? Is it because of the new industry, because of the tech, the Tammy world? Or is it just because of the, the, inc the increasing from the city, from, you know, expanding from Manhattan to the, to the boroughs? I think it's beyond Tammy. I mean, Tammy's part of it, but I, I do think this this making culture is a big part of it. And I think, 
you know, Seth's absolutely right. We need to stretch this into other communities. We need to stretch it outside the city and into, into other cores, transportation hubs. But you do have something special happening up and down the East River from Sunset Park to Long Island City in particular. But I would stretch it farther, and it goes into the South Bronx. There are seeds of redevelopment happening there, the banknote building, the project the Sunas are doing uh, around film. I, I think that is another great frontier. And some of it is being in beautiful buildings with great bones and good connectivity. Some of it is being near to these residential and brownstone communities that are coming back to life across the city. I, I think that it does stretch so, so farther. If we, if we have to look at the land that we have left, but we don't have much land. You have land near East New York. You have land <clears throat> in Coney Island. And part of the problem of both of those, one is a perception of crime in East New York and portions of Coney Island, and the other problem is the transportation Mm -hmm. because of the amount of time to go over there. Do you see one day, you know, because at one time East New York had a a substantial amount of industrial properties. Um, The Reckler family started in East New York. That was their first industrial building. In Maspeth, I think. But but yes, I mean, the point is is correct that, that, uh, you know, all of these communities um, had pasts that challenged – all of these challenged communities had pasts that were different from, from their, their current realities. And, you know, all of them, I think, have seen um, substantial changes in the last 20 years. Even the, the most downtrodden neighborhoods in the city are much safer than they were. And our infrastructure generally is much better than it was. The key, I think, to the long-term success of the city – and the region is one that we have to make sure that quality of life continues to improve or at least um, not to deteriorate. And two, that we have to keep investing in our infrastructure, both to ensure that that places that are currently uh, easily accessible remain easily accessible, but also to bring transportation to new areas. You have something, I brought it out before about my friend who's in the catering business who was thinking of going to you and he's now going to Long Island City. He was offered great incentives. New Jersey isn't sleeping. They're offering enormous incentives to take away these companies that grow green and other things. And Goya went there and other things. Do you see them as a major potential risk? I mean, if you look in the aggregate, New Jersey's economy is badly lagging, the economy of of the city um, and New York State more more generally. That's also a market that you're not allowed. You know, you're in New York. (laughs) Um, I, I, look, they're, they're, again, for the health of the region, we need all parts of the region to succeed. But I think economic development is about more than just tax incentives. What about, you know, we, we don't have much time. You, you brought up the, subje- the subject of the tram. When the tram was built for Long Island City, uh, for Roosevelt Island, it was a different market. It was because there was housing and there was nothing else, and the train didn't work. Do you see a tram perhaps uh, – it's, there's definitely an idea out there. Whether or not it's it's fully viable is, is, I think, still yet to be determined. But I think it would be, you know, a pretty interesting amenity to be able to add to to, to all the all the you know the new creation that's been going on up and down the, the East River. So I think in, in summation, it looks like that the boroughs are, are are growing and growing, and people are continuing to grow, and they're going to be moving into everybody's building and. Uh, Co-working is a big thing, and I'm happy that all of you were here to celebrate the, the beginning of my 15th season. I'd like to thank Seth, uh, Michael, Andrew, and Josh, and I'll see you next week.